Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Tim Poe. I'm Director of Telehealth with the UNC Cancer Network. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here today, January 23rd, 2019, for our Medical and Surgical Oncology Lecture. Just a few preliminaries and then we'll meet our guests and get started. Uh, if you are having any technical difficulties at all, uh, first and foremost, you can call us, 919-445-1000. You can also email us, unccn at unc.edu. If you're having any trouble at all with, with this presentation, let us know right now so that we can do everything possible to bring you into the presentation as quickly as possible. Uh, we're at, on the web at unccn.org. Lots of information about past presentations and future ones, as well as this one. You can find us on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, on Instagram, lots of other places that uh, you can locate information about our organization. All right, we will be using Poll Everywhere today. This will give you an opportunity to interact with our presenters during the presentation, and also to be, you'll be able to ask questions at the end. So two ways you can do this. I think the easiest way might be to just on any tablet, laptop, uh, smartphone, go to polev, P-O-L-L-E-V dot C-O-M forward slash U-N-C-C-N. So polev.com forward slash U-N-C-C-N. Uh, you'll be able to see the questions as they appear, answer them, and then you'll have a place to type in your own questions at the end. If for any reason you prefer to use te uh, texting feature on any phone with a texting capabilities, that's easy as well. You just in the to field type uh, 22333 and in the message field type in the letters UNCCN, send that, you'll get a message back saying that you've joined and then as the appropriate, uh, you'll, you'll just answer the letter corresponding with the answer to the question as it appears and then at the end you'll be able to type in your questions that way as well. The uh, poll will be asking, and this is an icebreaker, uh, should be a pretty straightforward one, just to make sure you get the hang of poll everywhere. Which of the following is not a hematologic cancer? If you believe that's A, you could put acute uh, myeloid leukemia. If you believe it's myodysplastic syndromes, you put in B, myeloma, C, or glioblastoma, D. And you'll, we'll, we'll make that actual poll pop up in just a minute. All right, and without further ado, Let's go ahead and meet our presenters, Dr. Reeves and Dr. Foster. Welcome, both of you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Thanks, Robert. I'm really glad to have you. So let's see. I've got a little bit of information that I know about you, Dr. Reeves. Uh, assistant professor in the Department of Hematology and Oncology at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And stop me if I get anything wrong. Uh, interests include hematologic oncology with a focus on cell uh, dyscrasis and myeloproliferative neoplasms and served as the principal investigator for several multiple myeloma clinical trials. That's right. All right. And Dr. Foster, uh, UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center member and associate professor of medicine in the Division of Hematology and Oncology, UNC Chapel Hill. And you work with clinical trials and translational research in acute myeloid leukemia, acute lymphoblastomic leukemia, and myelodysplastic syndromes. All right. Anything we should know about either of you? Uh, uh, Hobby or anything else you might want to tell our audience, Dr. Yeah. Reeves? No. Dr. Foster? All right. Very good. Very good. Well, we'll, we'll stop with that then. And um, there's our presenter information for Dr. Foster. And let's go ahead and take a look at that uh, poll. Uh, we're already leaning heavily towards uh, D for some reason. Uh, we'll give our listeners just a few more seconds. But uh, in the interest of time, how, are, how did they do? A plus. A plus. Great. So that would, that would certainly be the one that is not a hematologic cancer. I do have a few disclosures. This activity has been planned and implemented under the sole supervision of the course director in association with the UNC Office of Continuing Professional Development. Dr. Thomas Shea consults for Spectrum Pharma and receives research support from Millennium Atsuka, GSK, BMS, Novartis, and Seattle Genetics. Dr. James Coghill, MD, and CPD staff have no relevant financial relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. The speakers, Brandy Reeves, MD, and Matthew Foster, MD, have no conflicts of interest relevant to this presentation. All right, and with that out of the way, best of ASH 2018, Myeloma. 
Excellent. Thank All you. All right. Thank you. And I believe, should it say only myeloma or, or myeloma and leukemia slash MDS? Um, mine will just focus on myeloma and Dr. Perfect. Foster will talk oh, about okay. leukemia and Thank MDS. you so much. Yeah. Okay, so I have four big learning objectives to review in um, a lofty goal of 25 minutes. So the first is to understand the preferred frontline treatment options in newly diagnosed multiple myeloma in the U.S. and recognize ongoing clinical trials with daratumumab in this setting. Second is to review the data challenging upfront stem cell transplant in newly diagnosed multiple myeloma. Third is reviewing the role of exazomib in maintenance therapy. And lastly, recognizing BCMA as an important new target in the treatment of multiple myeloma. So let's start with a question. What is the preferred frontline induction treatment in the U.S. for newly diagnosed multiple myeloma in 2019? Is it A, high-dose melphalan with autologous stem cell transplant, B, a doublet regimen, C, a triplet, or D, a quartet? All right. How are they doing? Excellent. And I'm not sure how many responses this is, um, mm -hmm. but very nice. 100% of you um, chose a triplet regimen, um, which is considered the standard of care for newly diagnosed multiple myeloma in 2019. Now, which triplet is debatable with revlimid um, or lenalidomide, bortezomib, and dexamethasone um, being the um, most often standard, um, swapping out cyclophosphamide in those with renal dysfunction? and carfilzomib in those with high-risk disease. And the triplet therapy holds true for both transplant-eligible and ineligible patients. Now, the addition of the monoclonal antibody daratumumab to triplet backbones is being intensively studied, um, but the results are not yet mature. Um, and there's a nice reference at the bottom um, reviewing um, upfront therapy of myeloma. So this brings me to my first abstract which is um, the Griffin study looking at the addition of daratumumab to the VRD backbone in newly diagnosed multiple myeloma patients el eligible for transplant. So this was a phase two um, trial um, randomized to daratumumab VRD versus um, VRD, and this report is just on the safety running cohort of the first 16 patients. As a reminder, daratumumab is a monoclonal CD8, uh, CD38 antibody with both direct on-tumor effects and indirect immunomodulatory actions that has been approved as both monotherapy and in combination um, with standard of care regimens in both relapsed and refractory myeloma and um, newly diagnosed multiple myeloma. And as a background, um, we know that achieving a deeper um, response, um, SCR or better, in myeloma correlates with improved long-term outcomes after stem cell transplant. Bortezomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone, or VRD, followed by high-dose therapy with stem cell transplant and consolidation, has yielded very high response rates and progression-free survival in newly diagnosed multiple myeloma. And we also know that in five separate phase three studies, daratumumab added to other standard of care backbone regimens improved the depth of responses, including the um, rates of stringent complete response and MRD negative, negativity, and improved progression-free survival in patients with both relapse refractory and newly diagnosed multiple myeloma. So the hypothesis for this study was that the addition of daratumumab to the VRD backbone would be safe and effective in transplant-eligible patients with newly diagnosed myeloma. And so again, this was just the safety run-in phase, not the randomized portion. And patients were um, given daratumumab um, VRD, with daratumumab given once weekly, the bortezomib given on days 1, 4, 8, 11, lenalidomide given on days 1 to 14, um, and dex is seen here, in 21-day cycles. They received four cycles, followed by high-dose melphalan with stem cell transplant, two additional cycles of consolidation therapy, and then maintenance with daratumumab and lenalidomide, with daratumumab given monthly and lenalidomide given three weeks out of four, and dexamethasone given once monthly. As of October 2018, 16 patients um, were enrolled in the safety run-in. All of those had received um, consolidation therapy, and um, at, they had at least received at least three lines of or three cycles of maintenance therapy. The median age in this trial was 62 and a half years, with 75% um, of patients having ISS stage one disease and um, one third having high risk cytogenetics. 
This did prove to be a safe combination. Um, so while there were treatment um, uh, emergent adverse events in all 16 patients, um, none of them stopped treatment for an adverse event. And most importantly, stem cell collection was not impacted by the addition of daratumumab. As far as efficacy, this was impressive. So um, at a median follow-up of 17 months, the investigator initiated, uh, investigator assessed response rate at the end of induction was 94%, improving to 100% by the end of consolidation with improving depth of response. So by the end of consolidation, 100% of patients had achieved um, greater than or equal to a very good partial response. Um, and at the end, uh, during maintenance, 94% of patients had achieved at least um, a complete response, which is um, very impressive. MRD negativity um, to a sensitivity of 10 to the minus fifth um, was similar, improving to 50% MRD negativity by the end of consolidation. And importantly, um, 15 of 16 patients remain um, progression-free on um, study treatment at this 17-month follow-up period. So in summary, the addition of daratumumab to the VRD backbone in transplant-eligible patients with newly diagnosed myeloma has very impressive response rates and deep responses. The phase two randomized portion of this trial is close to accrual with 222 patients, and we um, eagerly await those results. So daratumumab, as a reminder, is approved as frontline therapy in combination with bortezomib, melphalan, and prednisone, but not yet with VRD, and as such is not typically used as frontline therapy in the United States. This brings me to my second abstract, looking at daratumumab um, to um, RD backbone in newly diagnosed trans uh, multiple myeloma patients ineligible for transplant. So this was a pre-specified interim analysis um, with a background of the first trial, which had showed that um, lenalidomide dexamethasone, or RD, significantly prolonged progression-free survival versus melphalan, prednisone, and thalidomide in transplant ineligible newly diagnosed myeloma patients at 26 versus 22 months. However, um, we know that triplet regimens, as we saw earlier, um, have consistently shown deeper responses and per better progression-free survival, which leads to the question, does the addition of daratumumab um, to the RD backbone improve progression-free survival and depth of response in newly diagnosed multiple myeloma? So this was a phase three randomized open-label multicenter trial termed MIA um, that randomized patients one-to-one -to, -one to receive either RD, um, 369 patients, or daratumumab RD, 368 patients. Daratumumab was given in our usual fashion um, weekly for the first two cycles, then every two weeks for cycles three to six, and every four weeks um, at cycle seven and beyond with lenalidomide given um, at days 1 to 21, um, and dexamethasone given once weekly. And importantly, um, these drugs were all given until um, disease progression. The primary endpoint here was progression-free survival, and the key secondary endpoints were depth of response, overall survival, and safety. And the efficacy here um, also look very impressive. So the um, daratumumab RD arm um, had better um, overall response rates at 93%, versus 81% with RD, and also improved depth of response with um, CR rates doubling at about 50% with the addition of daratumumab to 25% with the RD backbone alone. And similarly, the MRD negativity um, by next-gen sequencing at 10 to the minus fifth sensitivity, also 24% MRD negativity in the daratumumab arm versus 7% in the RD arm. The progression-free survival um, follows this um, with the um, median PFS not being reached in the daratumumab arm and 31.9 months in the RD arm with a hazard ratio of 0.5. So also impressive data um, that show that triplets continue to be better than doublets in multiple myeloma. But how does daratumumab RD compare to bortezomib RD, which has been um, our standard in um, this uh, treatment population? So there are two trials um, that really are looking at this, and one is the SWOG S0777, which was a phase three trial of um, bortezomib RD versus RD um, in newly diagnosed patients without the intent for immediate stem cell transplant. 
Here, the progression-free survival um, with the addition of bortezomib um, was 43 months versus 30 months. And there was, importantly here, an overall survival advantage at 75 versus 64 months with a hazard ratio of 0.7 as opposed to the 0.5 in um, the daratumumab RD. We can't, however, directly compare these hazard ratios um, as they were different um, study populations. And I think importantly to point out here is that bortezomib in this study was only given for a total of eight cycles, and then RD was continued, whereas daratumumab is given until disease progression, thereby potentially exposing patients to um, more um, toxicity um, and financial um, cost as well. And then there was RVD White, which was a phase two single arm study in transplant ineligible patients. Um, and this administered 15 cycles of the drugs um, in um, lower doses than the traditional RVD um, and in 35 day cycles. There wasn't any maintenance specified. However, 66% did ultimately get lenalidomide maintenance. And this reported a progression free survival um, that was very respectable at 35.1 months. So should we consider daratumumab RD as the new standard of care for transplant ineligible, newly diagnosed multiple myeloma patients? I don't think so yet. I would await more mature results, and I would really prefer a direct comparison of the regimens before uh, making that decision. And again, I'll note that daratumumab is not yet FDA approved as a frontline treatment in combination um, with RD. Okay, next audience response question. So when should high dose melphalan with an autologous stem cell transplant um, be considered in the treatment of newly diagnosed multiple myeloma? In first response for all eligible patients, in first relapse for all eligible patients, i.e. delayed transplant, or in first response only for those with high risk disease. And we want to say thank you again to everybody participating in these polls and remind you these are completely anonymous, so uh, don't hesitate to, to take a chance, uh, give your best guess as, as to what this answer might be. Well, it looks like we're running uh, pretty, pretty even between a couple of responses. Yeah, I like this. So um, not everybody in the group appears to be a transplanter. Good. Okay, so um, we've got actually the majority of um, folks voting for in first relapse, which would be um, called the delayed transplant. And for this, actually, um, I'm going to argue that still it should be in first response for all eligible patients. And that is because autologous stem cell transplant has shown improved depth of response and progression-free survival um, in all of the studies. Um, and but what we're pointing out is that overall survival benefit has remained hotly debated. The IFM 2009 trial showed better progression-free survival with upfront versus delayed stem cell transplant, but a comparable overall survival. This, however, has short follow-up as of yet. And there's an ongoing U.S. trial called Determination, which looks at VRD with either upfront or delayed stem cell transplant, followed by lenalidomide maintenance, um, which we um, very much anticipate but do not yet have results. And a reference is um, found at the bottom um, for where you can find a nice review on this topic. So this leads me to my next abstract, which is the FORTE trial, um, looking at carfilzomib lenalidomide dexamethasone, or KRD, with transplant versus KRD alone versus carfilzomib cyclophosphamide dexamethasone, KCD, in newly diagnosed multiple myeloma patients. This was a phase two randomized trial, um, and the last patient was enrolled in March 2017. This was randomized one to one to one to three arms. Arm A receiving um, carfilzomib cyclophosphamide dexamethasone, and arms B and C um, carfilzomib lenalidomide dexamethasone, all receiving four cycles, followed by stem cell mobilization. Arms A and B then going on to a single stem cell transplant. Arm C getting four additional cycles of KRD, and then all getting four additional cycles of consolidation therapy. And then further randomized to either single agent lenalidomide maintenance or carfilzomib lenalidomide maintenance with a medium follow-up of 26 months. So the results, um, again, show impressive overall response rates in all the arms with um, better response rates seen in the lenalidomide versus cyclophosphamide arms, both in overall response and depth of response. 
And in the blue, you see MRD negativity um, at about 55 to 60 percent in the lenalidomide arms versus 41 percent in the cyclophosphamide arm. More importantly here, um, there is not much difference between stem cell transplant and 12 cycles of KRD, leading to the question of do we need upfront um, stem cell transplant with these very active induction regimens. This is to be determined as we do not yet have maintenance data. Um, we just have the post-consolidation data for these um, patients. Regarding safety, this looked pretty safe and tolerable. So um, 6 to 8% of patients discontinued for adverse events, similar in all three arms. And in summary, at the completion of consolidation, the KRD regimens versus the cyclophosphamide regimen had improved um, depth of responses, including MRD negativity, that was statistically significant at 56% versus 42%. The maintenance data aren't yet mature. And this reinforces that when feasible, we should use lenalidomide over cyclophosphamide. And high-dose melphalan with um, autologous stem cell transplant is still the standard of care, but I do await the results of determination um, and this trial for overall survival data and factors that will influence response to ASCT um, to better inform my practice over the next few years. And my last question is which maintenance therapy is recommended for a patient with newly diagnosed multiple myeloma with standard risk disease who achieves a greater than VGPR after triplet induction followed by autologous stem cell transplant? Is it lenalidomide, bortezomib, ixazomib, both lenalidomide and ixazomib, or none? And again, thank you in advance for uh, participating in the polls and then uh, be thinking about your questions for the end of the presentation where we will have a, uh, you will have an opportunity to share those questions. Take just a few more seconds for anyone who has not already had an opportunity to respond. Dr. Reeves? Can't get anybody to go with anything other than lenalidomide, which is what I would have chosen here as well. So lenalidomide um, maintenance after stem cell transplant in standard risk disease remains the standard of care um, for multiple myeloma. So lenalidomide maintenance has shown um, both improved progression-free survival and overall survival over placebo, doubling PFS, and improving um, seven-year overall survival from 50% um, to 62% in standard risk myeloma. For high-risk myeloma, bortezomib is considered over lenalidomide, um, but there is no trial comparing these head-to-head, -head. and there's a nice review um, at the bottom. This leads me to my next um, abstract review which is um, the Termaline MM3 trial, which is maintenance therapy with ixazomib versus placebo in um, patients with newly diagnosed multiple myeloma after autologous stem cell transplant. So this study did a 3 to 2 randomization to ixazomib versus placebo, so 395 patients to 261. And in the ixazomib arm, patients received 3 milligrams of ixazomib weekly, um, increasing to 4 milligrams um, after cycle four, if tolerated. And the primary endpoint here was progression-free survival with a key secondary endpoint of overall survival. As far as safety, this also appeared to be safe with only 7% discontinuing exazomib due to an adverse event. Most common being um, infections, usually upper respiratory infections less than grade three, um, GI um, intolerability, um, diarrhea, nausea um, being the top, um, importantly, peripheral neuropathy was not different between the two arms, um, and in those whom, in whom it was present, it improved in 75% and resolved in 70% over time. And there was no increased risk of second primary malignancy. The response um, was actually um, deepening in both arms, um, was statistically significant um, better in the exazimib arm, 46% versus 32%. And MRD negativity, there was a trend toward um, better negativity in the exazomib group at 12% versus 7% in placebo. However, the, the, the study was not powered for MRD comparison. Now, as far as the PFS goes, um, 26.5 months in the exazomib arm versus 21.3 in the placebo arm, so a five-month PFS difference. 
not that impressive um, to me. Um, so how does this compare to lenalidomide maintenance? So there are two studies um, really looking at this, the IFM 2005 and CLGB 100104. Both used lenalidomide until progression um, versus placebo, and both reported essentially doubling of the progression-free survival versus the only five months seen in the exazomib study. Importantly, the CLGB trial, um, seen in the bottom panel here, um, also showed um, a slight improvement in overall survival. So in summary, exazomib versus placebo resulted in five months of additional PFS in maintenance therapy in newly diagnosed myeloma, had a good safety profile, but I would not use exazomib at this time in place of lenalidomide for maintenance um, unless the patient was lenalidomide intolerant or bortezomib intolerant. And I await the results of ongoing studies of exazomib and lenalidomide in combination or alone in high-risk patients and in an alternating strategy to better inform my practice. And lastly, in the relapsed and refractory category, um, I just want to introduce you to um, something that caught my eye, which was the AMG 420 anti-BCMA bite, or bispecific T-cell engager. So B-cell maturation antigen, or BCMA, is expressed on multiple myeloma cells, plasma cells, and mature B-cells. An AMG 420 is a monoclonal antibody for CD3 on T-cells, joined by a flexible linker to a monoclonal antibody for BCMA, and this causes the T cell to directly engage with uh, the BCMA uh, positive cell, resulting in T cell mediated lysis. This was a phase one first in human dose escalation study in patients with relapse refractory multiple myeloma with progression after greater than two prior lines of treatment, including a proteasome inhibitor um, and an immunomodulatory agent. The treatment was given as continuous infusion for four weeks, followed by a two-week break, um, and was given for up to five cycles or progressive disease, and five cycles could be given per investigator discretion. 35 patients had received the drug as of May 2018. And the results were pretty impressive. Um, the maximal tolerated dose here was the 400 micrograms per day, with um, cytokine release syndrome and polyneuropathy um, being the um, problematic at the 800 microgram dose. Of the patients in the 400 microgram per day group, seven of 10 responded. Four of those were MRD negative, stringent, complete responses, and six of those are still responding at seven and a half months, which is quite impressive in this heavily um, pretreated population. So in summary, um, BCMA has been a very good target in myeloma um, and available in several platforms, including monoclonal um, antibody drug conjugates, CAR-T, and um, now BITE, and this AMG420 construct should very promising results and would potentially be an off-the-shelf option for treatment rather than the wait time for CAR-T production um, for the relapse and refractory population. Um, this um, has been granted FDA fast-track designation, and we should be seeing it um, coming to clinical trial again soon. So in summary, um, none of the data um, from ASH 2018 were for me practice changing, um, but the mature data over the next few years um, will be very helpful to inform uh, practice. And there's my email address at the bottom if you'd like to contact me. All right. So if you want to pass that on to Dr. Foster. Thank you. Dr. Foster, if you want to just use that. Thanks for the Sure. Okay. Well, uh, thanks for having me again. Um, uh, it was an exciting ASH meeting in San Diego in 2018 with regard to leukemia. Um, I think as a uh, theme, we're continuing to see the decades of research and investment in research uh, regarding the molecular underpinnings of leukemia and how to target those mechanisms, uh, pay dividends in form of in the form of clinical results. When I often come back from ASH, uh, I am asked, uh, like Brandy just addressed, are there any practice changing abstracts that were presented? And fortunately this year in leukemia, uh, as well as several prior years, I think the answer is yes. And um, what I'd like to do is take you on a little bit of a whirlwind tour of several diseases uh, that fall into the basket of leukemia. Uh, first off, I'm gonna talk about uh, advances in upfront therapy for patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia, both older and younger patients. 
uh, patients with uh, lower risk myelodysplastic syndromes, and finally uh, AML or acute myeloid leukemia in older adults. So first off, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. As a matter of review, um, CLL is the most common leukemia in adults and an indolent lymphoproliferative neoplasm often presents with a very high bulk of disease due to its indolent nature, and patients can present with very high white blood cell count that appears like mature lymphocytes as seen in the peripheral blood smear here with these smudge cells. Uh, patients are generally not treated until they develop symptoms, which can include constitutional symptoms, symptoms of bone marrow failure, or adenopathy. And um, it's commonly said by a, a, a number of physicians that patients can live a long time with this disease because it is so indolent and can die of complications from other medical problems. However, that's an oversimplification. As you see on the survival curves to the right, uh, there are some patients that do, um, that do live years and even over a decade, sometimes without treatment, whereas uh, the other end of the spectrum, the survival curve here in uh, patients with the highest risk genetics and the highest risk biology typically have a median survival of only a few years um, and are in need for uh, improvements in therapy uh, in several of these groups. The most important advancement in uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia in recent years has been the understanding of the importance of targeting signaling that is downstream from the B cell receptor seen here in this diagram. The target with the best uh, therapeutic window is the Bruton's tyrosine kinase seen here. Uh, Brutinib has been the, was the first uh, BTK inhibitor approved for CLL. It's a small molecule orally available and approved several years ago for treatment of relapsed and refractory CLL, as well as uh, later upfront CLL due to some encouraging results in both older patients and patients with 17P deletions or TP53 mutations that typically don't respond to other approaches. The question remain, however, uh, is this uh, uh, an appropriate uh, therapy to use in the frontline setting, and how would it compare with the standards of care in CLL, which had for many years been chemoimmunotherapy, and that is immunotherapy with a CD20 targeting monoclonal antibody and chemotherapy that often includes alkylating agents and purine analogs. Unfortunately, the ASH uh, annual meeting started to answer both those questions in uh, both younger and older patients. The first study I want to show, um, both these studies came out of the U.S. intergroup system, it was uh, performed uh, out of the ECOG cooperative group, the E1912 study presented by Dr. Shanafelt from Stanford. Uh, this uh, was the younger adult population. This is uh, 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 the group of patients who were, uh, one would typically uh, approach with a uh, outpatient, more intensive chemoimmunotherapy approach called FCR, fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, and rituximab. Eligibility was patients under age 70 um, with good performance status and organ function. Um, and notably, none of these patients could have deletion 17P because fludarabine uh, is typically inactive in that population, and it would be unethical, unethical to randomize patients to fludarabine-containing therapies. The randomization was two to one, uh, and patients were randomized to either a brutinib rituximab, given uh, generally in combination for up to seven months, followed by eight, uh, followed by um, month eight and beyond a brutinib monotherapy until progression, versus the standard administration of the FCR regimen, uh, which is six months of an infusional ambulatory uh, uh, therapy, followed by observation until disease progression. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival. And as we can see, the um, study enrolled well. Uh, the patients were well balanced between the arms, generally representative of a younger CLL population with a median age of just under uh, 50, uh, 60 years of age, uh, well balanced between earlier stage and later stage diseases, uh, and um, a smattering of, of both kind of intermediate risk genetics and uh, more favorable risk genetics. Uh, and we w it wouldn't have been presented as a late-breaking abstract, and we wouldn't be talking about it here if it didn't meet its primary endpoint, and it did. Progression-free survival was approved in the abrutinib rituximab arm compared to FCR with a hazard ratio of 0.35, which was highly statistically significant, 
the uh, comparator arm FCR median um, uh, three-year PFS was around 75%, whereas it was around 90% with abrutinib rituximab. So that was the primary endpoint. The secondary endpoint was overall survival, and uh, one can see that it also met uh, statistical significance with a hazard ratio of 0.17, uh, with uh, a, a survival curve that by any definition meets uh, the definition of success in oncology that is virtually straight across, very close to 100%. Uh, the median, median follow-up in this study was about three years, so uh, there's a lot of follow-up to do with uh, the patients enrolled in this trial, but very encouraging results. Um, not surprising to many folks who treat CLL, the um, patterns of toxicity with these different arms was comparable to what we've seen in the clinic and in other trials. The FCR regimen is notorious for being both myelosuppressive and immunosuppressive, and so you see higher rates of, of infectious and hematologic toxicities, whereas uh, abrutinib does have some cardiac toxicity, and so we saw uh, significant but small but significant rates of atrial fibrillation and hypertension. Uh, I would note, though, that uh, abrutinib rituximab wasn't a walk in the park with the majority of these patients uh, having experienced some higher grade adverse events, but at the end of the day was, was more tolerable than the FCR regimen, and I think wasn't a surprise to many of us who treat CLL. A partner to this study was the Alliance study, which we participated in here from Lime, at Lineberger, and it was presented by uh, colleague Jen Woyak from the uh, Ohio State University the Alliance 041202 study, which was presented in the plenary session at ASH. Um, this was also treating untreated patients over age 65 who met the definitions uh, for needing uh, standard definitions for meriting treatment by disease bulk or symptoms. Patients were stratified by both clinical and genetic factors and randomized to one of three arms. The chemoimmunotherapy arm is one that's common, that has been commonly used for years in the CLL population, bindamustine with rituximab, which is uh, given monthly in an outpatient setting. And then there were two abrutinib arms, abrutinib monotherapy and abrutinib rituximab, followed by abrutinib monotherapy. Patients who progressed with bindamustine rituximab could, uh, could cross over to um, the abrutinib arm, uh, which affected uh, one of the endpoints, as you'll see shortly. Uh, very similar patient characteristics to the ECOG trial, albeit with an older population, um, median age just over 70 in these uh, different arms. Uh, the other difference that I want to highlight is that uh, patients with 17P deletions and TP53 mutations, the highest risk, uh, genetic risk subgroup that were excluded from the ECOG study were included in this study, uh, and there were a smattering of patients that seemed well balanced among those arms. Uh, again, this study met its progression-free survival endpoint uh, with uh, both the abrutinib and abrutinib rituximab arms performing better than bindamustine rituximab to the tune of the, the two-year uh, PFS estimates of uh, almost 90% for the abrutinib arms with about three-quarters of the patients uh, alive without progression in the BR arm. So it met its primary endpoint. Um, However, it didn't improve overall survival, likely due to the fact that there was crossover from the progressing patients on the BR arm to the abrutinib arm. Similar to the, um, the ECOG study, we saw higher grades, of, higher grades and more frequent hematologic and infectious toxicities with bindamustine rituximab and higher rates of cardiac toxicities with uh, atrial fibrillation and hypertension in the abrutinib arms. But I would call your attention to the fact that these, the rates of these were higher in the older population. Again, population of more at risk for cardiovascular complications. Notable in both trials was that there were very low rates of bleeding. Abrutinib has some antiplatelet properties, and this was reassuring to see this uh, fleshed out in both these trials. So at the end of the day, I think um, both these trials uh, stress that abrutinib should be considered a standard of care frontline, if not the standard of care frontline in 2019. Um, it's, a, it's an oral indefinite therapy, and as the toxicity profile shows, uh, an oral therapy isn't without its toxicities. However, it is better tolerated than chemoimmunotherapy, 
and, um, and should be in the conversation for all newly diagnosed patients who merit treatment. Um, there are some reasons that one would consider using chemoimmunotherapy still, uh, including duration of treatment, um, cost, and uh, individual patient comorbidities and patient factors. However, ibrutinib needs to be in the conversation. Switching gears a little bit to another indolent uh, hematologic cancer, lower risk myelodysplastic syndrome. So myelodysplastic syndrome, I often describe to patients as a um, as uh, not a syndrome, but a bone marrow cancer. It's a cancer uh, derived of myeloid cells um, and uh, results in bone marrow failure. Similar to CLL, however, the prognosis of myelodysplastic syndromes, plural, uh, is, can be very disparate. Um, there, are, there are patients who are higher risk on the IPSS, the revised IPSS scoring system shown here, that have prognosis very similar to the highest risk leukemia patients who have very short expected survival. On the other end of the spectrum, you have patients who have uh, more promising uh, uh, diagnostic and, and uh, genetic variables that suggest a very promising long-term survival. These patients can survive many years, often with the complication of needing uh, transfusional support during this time. Ironically, the um, Drug development has been focused in MDS predominantly on the higher risk patients rather than the lower risk patients with the development of azacitabine and decitabine, the hypomethylating agents. The standard of care for lower risk patients has generally been either best supportive care or best supportive care with transfusions and the addition of erythropoiesis stimulating agents like darbipoetin, synthetic analogs of, of erythropoietin. When those therapies uh, are not sufficient to keep patients without transfusion, there really has not been any standard of care. And there were a couple of abstracts I'd like to highlight that came out of ASH. Um, one subset of myelodysplastic syndrome is MDS with ring sideroblasts. Now, ring sideroblasts are seen in the, the uh, bone marrow aspirate smear here, which is, uh, uh, has an iron stain applied to it, are these iron-containing uh, mitochondria that ring the erythroblast um, nucleus here, and that's how they get their name. We now understand that some of the biologic underpinnings, uh, that many of the patients with this subset of myelodysplastic syndromes have a mutation in the gene SF3B1. This encodes uh, part of the spliceosome machinery and results in uh, altered cellular iron homeostasis and iron accumulation in macrophages here, and that's how you get the, uh, the morphology. Um, Luspatercept uh, is a drug that is known as a ligand trap. It traps ligands, proteins that are seen here, active in A and GDF11, that are part of this transforming growth factor beta, or TGF beta, um, superfamily. Uh, when these ligands signal through their receptor, they result in downstream signaling that results in block and differentiation of erythroid cells. So these erythroblasts that are normally in the marrow can't mature to um, red blood cells and, be, uh, and, and help with patient's anemia. Notably, this is in the later stages of maturation and erythropoietin acts on the earlier stages of maturation. So in patients who are maybe resistant to erythropoiesis stimulating agents, uh, this acts in a different way by binding, uh, binding these ligands and improving differentiate, erythroid differentiation. I showed you the slide about the SF3B1 mutations because earlier uh, uh, trials of loose patercept in patients with lower risk MDS showed that patients with SF3B1 mutations were more likely to respond uh, to loose patercept than patients with other molecular profiles. And as a result, that informed the design of this uh, trial known as the Metalist trial, which is presented by Dr. List uh, from Moffitt uh, Cancer Center in Tampa. The Metalist trial uh, enrolled patients with MDS with ring sideroblasts or patients with, uh, which uh, MDS with ring sideroblasts classically is defined as greater than 15% ring sideroblasts in the marrow. Um, it also enrolled patients with SF3B1 mutations as long as they had at least 5% uh, uh, ring sideroblasts in the marrow. It didn't enroll the higher risk patients with excess myeloblasts. Um, patients had on the IPSS scoring system had to have 
uh, very low, low or intermediate risk on the revised scoring system. They had to have either been progressed, uh, their anemia had progressed on erythropoiesis stimulating agents, uh, intolerant of ESAs, or unlikely to benefit on the basis of uh, pretreatment high erythropoietin level in the blood. Those patients typically don't respond to ESAs. And they had to have anemia that was transfusion dependent, so there was something to improve. Uh, they were randomized two to one to receive Luspatercept, which is administered as a every three week subcutaneous injection or placebo, and they were followed um, with the primary endpoint being transfusion independence of eight weeks or longer. Um, and as I said, it was presented at the, um, at the uh, plenary session at the ASH annual meeting because it was a positive trial. You can see that the transfusion independence of eight weeks or longer was achieved in almost 40% of patients, whereas, whereas it was only just north of 10% in placebo patients. Most of those patients achieved, achieved transfusion independence that lasted over three months or over 12 weeks. And uh, just over 50% of patients had hematologic improvement. That includes patients who were transfusion independent, as well as those who had decrease in transfusion needs but weren't completely independent of transfusions. So these are encouraging results. However, the duration of response uh, could stand to be improved. The durate, median duration of transfusion independence was only just over six months. So these patients with, long, with a projected long-term survival uh, could benefit from longer transfusion independence. And so I think this is the beginning of a, of a good and interesting story in this population of MDS patients, but probably not the end of the story. As a result of these uh, results, my understanding is that uh, a new drug application has been submitted to the FDA to be reviewed this year. One other complication in patients with lower risk MDS is that of iron overload. Um, simply put, uh, patients get uh, 200 to 250 milligrams of elemental iron with each unit of blood. And if you calculate that out, someone with a heavy transfusion burden, such as two to four units per month, can get an excess of five to 10 grams of iron uh, per year. And this is really important with patients who are likely to live several years with these type of transfusion burden. And what happens to the iron, as is shown in the MRIs here, this is a normal MRI of the liver and heart the iron gets deposited in the myocardium, as seen here, in the dark, or in the liver, as seen in the dark uh, appearance of the liver here on MRI. And this can result in hepatic and cardiac dysfunction as well as some other organ dysfunction. The general practice has been on the basis of uh, some uncontrolled trials that we think that iron chelation with chelating agents um, can improve ferritin levels, and, and perhaps prevent some of this organ damage in patients with lower risk MDS. It's been well proven in patients with decades of transfusion dependence, such as transfusion dependence, such as patients with thalassemia. However, we've gone on the basis of uncontrolled trials in the MDS community. The Telesto trial was presented in one of the MDS sessions at ASH, and it compared deferisorox, which is an oral iron chelator, versus placebo in patients with lower risk myelodysplastic syndrome. The eligibility for this trial was uh, IPSS lower intermediate one myelodysplastic syndrome, iron overload as evidenced by ferritin over 1,000, and a significant transfusion history with good baseline organ function. The primary endpoint was a composite one looking at cardiac events, hepatic events, uh, both of these determined by independent review and transformation to AML or death. As one would expect, the patients on chelation therapy had reduction in uh, serum ferritin, whereas those not on chelation therapy had rise in their serum ferritin because they were continuing to get transfusions. This met its primary in, uh, composite endpoint uh, with event-free survival. Um, and uh, the difference in the median is, a, is around a year on these curves. Um, so um, uh, it met its, in, its EFS endpoint, and each uh, subset of those endpoints, while the trial was not powered to uh, determine if there was a difference with regard to AML progression, cardiac events, hepatic events, or deaths, all those numbers were lower uh, in the deferisorox arm compared to placebo. So um, because 
of the uh, landscape of the uh, deferous rocks being readily available, it's unlikely that there will be another larger trial like this. And so this is maybe not practice changing, but I think practice confirming for many of us who are uh, treating these patients uh, and, and giving them chelation. Now finally, I'd like to address uh, AML in older adults, a much more aggressive uh, myeloid malignancy than the lower risk myeloid dysplastic syndrome. For a long time, this has been known as a uh, area of immense unmet need. Um, this slide and ones like it uh, are opening slides to many uh, talks about AML in older adults. We've seen over the decades, and these are results from uh, large clinical trials, that uh, over the decades, improvements in outcomes in younger adults with AML have largely resulted from better application of allogeneic stem cell transplant, whereas uh, drug development, uh, which would be needed to improve outcomes in older adults, has really been lagging and really hasn't moved the needle over the decades. Over the last two years, there have been several new drugs developed for and approved for AML. Uh, one of the most recent approvals and of interest to patients uh, with, uh, in the older age range uh, is venetoclax. So venetoclax is approved for chronic lymphocytic leukemia in relapse and recently was approved for AML. Uh, this is a BCL2 inhibitor. BCL2 is one of the BCL family of proteins that regulate apoptosis or, uh, regu or um, programmed cell death. So with cancer, with AML and CLL, you want the cancer cells to undergo orderly death, which doesn't happen in many cases. Um, and we found that uh, by inhibiting BCL2, this can be an active strategy in both diseases. With AML, there, was, there were some responses seen with venetoclax monotherapy in earlier trials. However, the responses were, were lacking, and so there was interest in grafting this to um, standard of care approaches like low-dose cytarabine. Uh, or azacitabine, decitabine, treatments that are a common practice in the U.S. and other parts of the world. What I've shown here is uh, data from a phase 1b study that, it, that was used to get this, the venetoclax plus HMA therapy or hypomethylating agent therapy approved by the FDA in late 2018. Um, this was a multicenter phase 1b trial. Um, and it's recently been published. Uh, you'll see that because it's a phase one, there are multiple dosing cohorts um, here, and there's a stair-step approach here because, um, as was seen in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, one of the complications of this drug is tumor lysis syndrome. And so there is a, uh, an intrapatient dose escalation that's the standard of care, and that's why each, do each dose cohort has multiple doses. This is escalated over seven days, and patients are monitored for tumor lysis syndrome, which is a, a very uncommon complication, uh, at least in clinical trials in the AML population. The CR, complete response, or CRI, complete response with incomplete hematologic recovery rate of 67% across the different arms in this trial, is, was substantially higher than what we see with HMA therapy alone, which is typically not much higher than 20 percent. Um, this was achieved across multiple dose cohorts, and it appeared that uh, patients are, um, the, are living and maintaining their responses up to a year, which is, um, leaves room for improvement, but is encouraging. And based on this data, this drug was approved with combination therapy for th in older adults with either HMAs or low-dose cytarabine. Uh, notably, there is a small subset of patients who get very deep responses, so MRD negative, measurable residual disease negative, uh, and those patients seem to have even more prolonged benefit. Uh, I don't have time in this lecture to go through all 14 of the ASH abstracts that, that looked at venetoclax plus either HMA or low-dose cytarabine, but suffice it to say that multiple different centers have been using this, including our own, using off-label venetoclax for, uh, for the last couple of years, including other um, clinical trials as well, that have all shown encouraging response rates. And we eagerly await results of a phase three trial comparing uh, HMA alone versus HMA plus venetoclax. This, uh, these outcome, this trial will determine uh, 
uh, what out outcomes to expect, how to ex how to select patients for this therapy, and how to support them through it. So this is a story that is early in its telling and is an encouraging advancement for patient, older patients with AML. And I expect even more exciting things from ASH next year. So um, I group my audience response uh, questions at the end of the talk, so we'll have to remember the whole thing here. So uh, this is a, a small case, a 73-year-old with uh, heart disease is considering treatment for CLL. Which of the following toxicities would be more likely experienced if they took a brutinib versus bendamustine rituximab? A, infection, B, anemia, C, hypertension, and D, rash. And some quick responses yeah. there. <laughs> Happy trigger finger, and they were right. Oh, yeah. good. Good. Um, next question. Patient with MDS with ring sitter blast is considering therapeutic options. What benefit can they expect from loose powder set? A, increased rates of complete remission. B, fewer red blood cell transfusions. C, fewer platelet transfusions. Or D, lower rates of transformation to leukemia. Maybe the same person was <laughs> eagerly waiting and, and uh, answered that one. That is correct. Great. And finally, the same. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> the same patient receives this powder set, but transfusion needs return after six months of transfusion independence. Which organ has a lower rate of uh, dysfunction if deferocerox is used? Is it A, heart, cardiac dysfunction, B, brain dysfunction, C, ocular dysfunction, or D, renal dysfunction? And occasionally we get a response that comes in late from the previous question. So yeah, I bet that uh, was questions are back to back. That, that was probably someone happen. selected C from the previous. Sure. One. Regardless, I think there is a, a little bit of a split opinion here. The um, the answer is cardiac dysfunction. Um, uh, ocular toxicity has been associated with some of the chelating agents, uh, but didn't really play out as a major factor in that uh, in the trial that we uh, discussed. So. Those are good good thoughts. Great. All right. If you want to advance to that next slide, and if you can pass that back my way, that keyboard, I'll go ahead and uh, move us on to the the Q and A portion. So this is where our our very quick audience uh, has an opportunity to go ahead and text in questions. So if you would please, uh, any whoops, and let me get back to that frame. Any questions that you may have. Uh, for Dr. Reeves or Dr. Foster, please go ahead and uh, text us, or if you're using a, a smartphone, tablet, uh, computer, go ahead and, and send those through the app there. And uh, I know we're, we're getting to the end of the hour, so we do understand that uh, many of you have to, to go off and, um, and uh, attend to other responsibilities, but we'll leave just a few more seconds for any questions that they may have. All right, and I do think it looks like it's possible, since we're right up on 1 o'clock, that, that we, our audience has, has had to leave. Uh, so we will go on and, and say our thank yous. We want to thank uh, the generous support of the North Carolina General Assembly for the UCRF, or University Cancer Research Fund, and the funding for UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. We want to thank Mary King, Veneranda Obore, and John Powell for all the hard work that they do for each and every one of these lectures. Uh, upcoming, we have an RN and Allied Health Lecture on February 13th, Safety Considerations When Managing Dietary Supplements in Cancer Care with Jacob Hill, and then we have a medical and surgical oncology lecture on February 27th uh, at noon as well. Key 2018-2019 developments and lymphoma and thrombosis anticoagulation with Dr. Mall and Dr. Beaven. So we look forward to having you for both of those lectures. Uh, we're always adding more self-paced lectures to our portal, uh, so you can find those on our site. 
uh, including a new RN in allied health lecture, understanding oncology drug interactions with Dr. Morgan, and uh, in the med surge category, aerobic resistance, exercise and cancer patients, methods and benefits with Dr. Vadiglini and Dr. Wood. Uh, thank you all so much. We really appreciate your attendance. Thank you, Dr. Reeves. Thank you, Dr. Foster. It's been great to have you both here. And until next time, have a great afternoon. Thank, thank you, Tim.